good night to our Calvary Assembly family and all of our friends joining us tonight. Pastor Hanif Back is here. Welcome to Let's Build a Bridge. We're building a bridge back to the heart of God through study of His Word. I know you're going to enjoy it. Get your Bibles together, notepad, pencils, and everything, and let's enjoy this. So don't forget to like and share the video. This current series we're doing is entitled The Acts of the Holy Spirit as we study through the book of Acts. Enjoy this program. Tonight on Let's Build a Bridge, I want to move into chapter 6 of the book of Acts as we continue the series, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now tonight's installment will be this, Why Do We Need Deacons? Acts chapter 6 begins uh, to introduce the, this uh, idea of the church having deacons. And of course, later on, we'll see deaconesses also, which is biblical. So uh, here are a couple of things we want to touch on as we go. Please get your Bibles open at chapter 6. Um, threats against the church, deacons being the answer. And then we'll talk about uh, how deacons will uh, respond to that call. Who are deacons? We'll try to describe that. And what do deacons do? Amen. We'll come to all of that. But first, let's begin with a word of prayer. Join me right now. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, thank you again, Lord, that we could study the Word of God. We want to prepare our hearts for you, Lord. We want to surrender to you. We want to understand your word, that our lives would align with you, Heavenly Father. We want our lives aligning with the Word, O oh God. And we want to make sure, Lord, that whatsoever we do, it will be a blessing to your people and it will add glory to your name. So, Lord, teach us and bless us to, together. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Now, so Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, of whom uh, we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. When it says a proselyte of Antioch, it means he was not Jewish. He was Gentile, but he ac adopted the Jewish faith. Now he's converted to Jesus Christ. He was a proselyte whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Praise God. Now, threats against the church. Up to this point, Acts chapter 6, We've seen several things that threaten the church's existence and development. Some challenges may be of human factors, and some definitely from the kingdom of darkness. Some from an external source, as we have seen in chapters 3 and 4, when the believers, uh, Peter and John, were arrested and they were persecuted. And some, uh, have, some of these issues have an internal uh, source. As we saw in chapter 5, last time we talked about Ananias and Sapphira, and we saw that internally there was a seed the devil was trying to sow to bring a halt to the move of the Spirit of God. But the Holy Spirit was totally in charge, and it was the birthing of the church, and he took care of that. But remember, Jesus said this, he will build a church. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to ensure that the church will be built to his liking. Praise God. Amen. When we know that the Holy Spirit is in charge, when we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, when we act the way Jesus wants us to act, 
the church will be strong and it will grow. Amen. And there is no power that can stop the church. Other institutions might fail, but the church will always be there until Jesus comes again. Here in Acts chapter 6, we see the threat of division. Satan never takes a break from attacking the church. But Jesus promised, listen to this, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit directed the, the affairs here. And the Bible says here, watch, we, we read it. The souls were multiplied. Amen. We saw that in verse number seven. The word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. You have read before in chapter three and four where the Lord added to the church. Now we're seeing a multiplication. Praise God. And it's the, the answer to all of this has to do with deacons. So, uh, let's see how the Holy Spirit worked in that situation. First of all, I w we need to establish deacons are a vital part of the answer. All right? Praise God. So, so there arose in those days, verse number one, a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. So, uh, the folks had come from many countries. They were of Jewish descent, but those in the foreign countries were adopt they were they grew up and they were of greek culture they were called hellenistic uh, they were of the greek culture um, in those foreign countries and so they came for the uh the feast the, there was the feast of the uh of pentecost and now the word of god is is uh given jesus is alive hallelujah and uh and so uh, the Holy Spirit being poured out, the church began to grow. People are getting saved and committed to the Lord. And then they started to take care of them. The local Jewish people who were Hebrew speaking of the Hebrew culture, uh, they adopted the brethren who came from overseas. They were of Grecian culture and they had a fellowship going. But then as they took care of them, the Grecians, uh, Greek speaking Jews, they started to complain. They said, you, you know, we think, we think there's a little prejudice going on here because you folks are being kinder to your own people who are here in Jerusalem and in Judea, these uh, Hebrew-speaking uh, people. So there's a murmuring going on. You know what was happening then? The devil had tried in chapter 5 hypocrisy to undermine the integrity of the church. Now he's trying division. He's raising division. Uh, but the answer was this, the 12 called the multitude and he said, and they said, listen, it's not reasonable that we should be the ones uh, taking care of people's needs, or, um, all these things. We need time to study the Torah and the Tanakh, and we need time to wait on the Holy Spirit that he will tell us what word we should preach unto you. You see, folks, I'll tell you something. Um, the people who would have the anointing of the Holy Spirit must be prepared to spend time with the Holy Spirit. Spend time in the presence of Jesus. Spend time at the foot of the cross. Amen. And, and uh, the anointing will, will come. The anointing is not for busy people. And if you want your pastor to do an excellent job and to, and to be uh, uh, powerfully used by God, if you can take away some of the other duties and give him time to study the word and for prayer. Amen. This, this is what it's all about here. And so uh, there are things about the church that need to get done. And, and helpers are always needed. Volunteers. This is the way the church has always developed. Down through the centuries, volunteerism has been a key to church uh, growth and success. All through the centuries. Anyway, so now we're coming back here. And they say, the, the disciples, the apostles said, uh, look ye out among yourselves, right? Uh, first of all, notice that these deacons are selected from among the brethren, not outsiders. They are saved, they are serving, they are faithful, they have been proven. Uh, Timothy says, not a novice, amen? They have been proven. And so he says here, listen, look out for them, men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, uh, whom we may appoint over, over this business. Praise God. So uh, 
those who were underprivileged were now being served. Amen. Of course, they were all Christ followers. The apostles uh, led the selection of the deacons. Now, the Greek word that was used here, that those who may serve tables, is the word diakonos, uh, meaning that they would serve tables. They would be servants. All right. So let's expand a little bit. Try to understand what the servant concept is all about. Servants are faithful to their master and performs duties without expectation of thanks or compliments. Of course, good masters will reward faithful servants, but the, the servants do not expect thanks or compliments. Deacons are, ser are servants and called in a special position to serve the body of Christ. They are servants to the believers, as well as they are support to the church leaders. Deacons are somewhere between the leaders and, and the, uh, the rest of the congregation. And they, they support the leaders and they serve the rest of the congregation. So that's, what it, that's how it goes. Thank God for those who are willing to take on these responsibilities. Hallelujah. And I always advocate that believers should honor and esteem highly deacons and church leaders because they are willing to take on such responsibilities. Let me show you something quickly in Matthew chapter uh, 20. Praise God. Matthew 20 verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. In, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, here, here's what uh, Jesus said, uh, neither... Uh, it says, but, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. Amen. I like the little statement David Guzik put on this in his Bible commentary. He said, they accepted the call to unglamorous service. Hallelujah. That's powerful to me. The call was to serve tables like domestic servants. In other words, they were to serve guests. They were to be nice to everybody and they are to clean up the mess. I've been to banquet halls and some of you have been, been to banquet halls and you've been places where uh, servants, maybe in restaurants, the servants come and they will, they will serve your needs and they have to be nice to you. Some people are not nice to the servants, but the servants can't react to that. They must be nice to everybody. And then when everybody is done and happy, the servants will come to clean up the mess. Amen. Listen, that's the position deacons have taken. That's why we esteem them. We honor them because they have taken this humble role. In Jesus' view, watch this. In Jesus' view, Towels are more important than titles. And you got to remember that Jesus himself took a basin of water and a towel and he stooped low to wash the feet of the disciples. When they got into the upper room that night, a uh, night of the Passover, when he instituted what we call Holy Communion, um, the, as, as guests come in, it is expected that the household servant will be washing the guest's feet as they enter. But apparently there was no household guest uh, uh, servant at the time. Amen. And, uh, and so maybe one of the disciples should just jump forward and say, listen, I volunteer. I'm going to be the servant and wash everybody's feet. But no one did. No one did. And Jesus just thought to himself, let me do this. And he humbled himself, became, and played the role of the household servant. Amen. Uh, you know, in fact, I think one of the disciples should have, should have done that. The servant is faithful to his duty. He's not neglectful. 
He doesn't work for praise. Whether he's thanked or not, he still performs his best. Deacons are God's solution to church conflict, not the source of conflict. Then they serve the needs of the needy and work to promote unity among believers. Hallelujah. So unity is accomplished when deacons and deaconesses, all right, guide everyone to the common vision of the pastor. Amen. That's what was done in chapter 6. It's still being done up to this day. Deacons answer the call through obedience. Indeed, preparing sermons and prayer uh, demands time. So pastors cannot be effective if they are taken up with other tasks which volunteers or staff can perform. Take notice how the church developed with the introduction of deacons. I like to put a track on this. We started off with uh, the believers in the upper room. Now we're having uh, deacons being added to the apostles. And then later on in the New Testament, you'll see the appearance of bishops and overseers, presbyters. You'll see all that uh, happening. The church continued to grow. It developed. There are new offices, new roles. And uh, I'm going to stop on that right here. But the organizational structure can be modified to become relevant. And care must be taken uh, to not drift from the basic biblical truths. Although you modify your methodology, the message must remain the same. Basic biblical truths. So God's call is not the same as a career. The call of God uh, to any role of church leadership. It's, uh, it's not to be regarded as a career. Careers can change depending on external factors such as remuneration, uh, location. You can consider a number of things and move from one career to the next career. But listen, your calling is from the Lord and it is settled internally. Amen. The calling of God, watch this, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 29. I'm reading the amplified version of that verse. Romans 11, 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For he does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. You may change phases in the course of ministry and reach higher potentials, but never regress. This call of God requires obedience. Listen, obedience is the key. Obedience means it is stepping into your anointing. On the other hand, disobedience is not doing what you're anointed for. And then some people might want to do things presumptuously. Presumption or a presumptuous attitude or conduct is doing what you are not anointed for. I should mention it was significant that the deacons were of Greek culture. You'll notice all the names that we called. They were not Jewish names. They're all of Greek culture. And that probably made the complainers happy. They were Greek-speaking people who were unhappy. Here, we're not, here we have given them Greek-speaking deacons to serve them. So they can't say the Jewish-speaking people are doing some kind of thing that they're not happy with. All right, now... Let's talk about who are deacons. The characteristics of deacons in this text of scripture here, all right? Of course, you'll find other qualifications of deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, I know that we are addressing deacons, but, but God will still use each and every one of us in similar ways. Only God knows what he has for each one of us in the future. So don't turn me off because I say deacons. It's for every one of us. And who knows where God's going to lead you. The Amplified Version of verse number 3, uh, Acts 6 and verse number 3, the Amplified Version says, Therefore, brothers, choose from among you seven men with good repetition, men of godly character and moral integrity, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So here it is. First of all, there must be people of good repetition, good report, people of good report. As a church leader, your repetition is important to, re to gain respect 
and have a voice that people will want to follow. Be careful how you carry your conversation, both among brethren, brethren and in the hearing of strangers. You're an ambassador. You're an ambassador of the Lord. You're an ambassador of your assembly. You're an ambassador of your pastor. It's important. Your good report begins where? In your home. So let's look at the question. How will your family speak of you and your Christianity? If you're going to be a church leader, that's a vital question to deal with. The second thing about deacons is they must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Leaders must be baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. The Spirit will energize you for the task and then they, He produces in you the fruit of the Spirit which produces the image of Christ and He also endows you with the gifts of the Spirit for ministry and service. Hallelujah. Uh, the Spirit gives boldness. He helps you to overcome shyness and timidity I can talk a whole lot about that because that's where I came from. But God has helped me over time. I, I dare say even now, there are times when I tend to become uh, shy and timid. But, but I depend on the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit brings miraculous results in your ministry and service. Also, next qualification of the deacons we see here is wisdom. The Spirit of God gives heavenly wisdom to those who ask in prayer. James 1.5 If any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. Amen. We need wisdom to respond to some questions and statements that people make. Be sure you don't project your personality or do things for self-gratification, but that you honor Christ in everything. Let's talk about what deacons do. Well, deacons serve, right? The functions of deacons, they serve. They serve people. They must be nice to everyone. And they must clean up their mess. So this includes the distribution of food, sometimes money, sometimes clothing, prayer for people's needs, visit the sick or the imprisoned, and wherever there are such needs. Spirit-filled deacons would have purity of thoughts as they served widows. Amen. And so they needed encouragements and tenacity as they faced conflicts and discouraging attitudes and circumstances. When it comes to church activities, if the leader promotes it, it will succeed. If the leader doesn't show interest, it will die a painful death. That's the importance of deacons, my friend, when it comes to church work. Secondly, the, the deacons unify. They serve, they unify. And that's what we saw in the book of Acts chapter 6. Uh, they understand people. They empathize with people. They persuade people to trust God. And they remove prejudices. So we work towards unity among brethren. And deacons are vital in this role. Your voice means a lot. You can heal a situation or you can make it worse. It's not unusual for them to have followers. Every deacon, every church leader have a little clique. They have their followers. Use your influence to promote the common goals of the assembly. Unfortunately, some leaders create segregation and sometimes church split. That's why submission to your pastor is vitally important. Thirdly, they serve, they unify, and they multiply. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I alluded to this earlier in the earlier chapters. We saw souls are added to the church. Now when we see deacons are added in verse number seven here, we saw that the church multiplied. Hallelujah. So the function of deacons come along and cause multiplication of souls in the kingdom. Praise God. Deacons didn't remain always serving tables. That's not their permanent role. That's an entry level. We have seen deacons develop. We see Stephen preaching the word of God. 
the next installment we'll talk about Stephen. Amen. Philip became an evangelist. Hallelujah. And he, he did some great things for the Lord. So there is room for development as the Spirit opens doors. You should pursue personal spiritual development at whatever level, whatever role that you're playing. You're doing something for God. Do not be content being just that and there, but look for personal development in your study prayers, interactions with people, and in serving. Hallelujah. You want to leave a mark? The greatest mark that you can leave is to serve. Because when you're not there, they're going to miss somebody serving them. Amen. Serve, my friend. So let's bring this all to a conclusion. You have a calling from the Lord. Make good on it. Serve well. Your service will unify brethren and result in multiplication of souls for Christ. You know, someone said this, the pastor is God's gift to the church. Deacons and deaconesses are the church's gift to the pastor. You may not be a deacon now, but you too are called to serve. You are called to unify and through you, multiplication can happen. You never know what God is preparing you for. Keep the focus. Stay on track. Be faithful. We must have a vision. Listen, we must have a vision to rob hell and populate heaven for God. His heart is to have his house full. And you and I are the ones he's going to use to do that. Amen. I want to pray with you as we bring this, uh, this uh, session of Let's Build a Bridge uh, to a conclusion tonight. Amen. I want to pray with you. And uh, if God spoke to you tonight in some way, join me and let's pray together. Hallelujah. The first thing is to make your commitment. Say this prayer. Say, dear God in heaven, I call on you because I know I might have missed my calling I need to come back to you, Lord. Receive me tonight. Make me your child. Restore me, O God, and let your calling be renewed upon my life. I surrender. I thank you that Christ died for my sins and he arose again triumphantly that I can be a child of God. I want to be useful to you, Lord, and I surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for you tonight. And I want you to just continue to be firm and consistent and live for the Lord. Find a place in the body of Christ where you can serve. Hallelujah. Let me pray with you before we close off this version of uh, Let's Build a Bridge. And I want to pray for your needs. Praise God. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, for every person here joining this Bible study session. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would flow mightily and do a work, my God. Do miraculous things in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Search through their lives, in their hearts, in their family, in their home, O God. And I pray that you remove every shadow of darkness, every seed that the devil is sowing, every evil thing that tries to permeate into their lives, O God. I rebuke it, I resist it in Jesus' name. And I pray that you would set lives for you, O God, that we can live for you and we can serve you and your body. And Jesus, Lord, I pray for their needs, God. I pray for those who are sick tonight. And I ask for healing in the name of Jesus because the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same today. And you can do it, Lord God. I pray that you would minister powerfully in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Touch them right now, O God. And bring forth testimonies that would bring glory to your name. Minister to all kinds of needs, Heavenly Father. We trust and we depend on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. So I want to thank you for joining us here tonight. And I hope that you enjoyed the Bible study as we build a bridge back to the heart of God. Don't forget to like and share the video. Now, please remember, our services are Friday night prayer meeting at 7.30. Our Sunday services are 8 a.m. and 10.15 a.m. All of our services are in person and online, Facebook and YouTube. You can go on the church website to register for the in-person service. 
at www.calvaryozone.org. You can also give online. Now, these Bible study installments are put up on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. If you miss it in real time, you can go back and replay that. Don't forget, we're looking forward for you coming back into the sanctuary. We'd love to have you come. We have great fellowship together. And if for any reason you're not able to come, you can join us on the live stream. So God bless you. We love you.